Hi, I'm Deb Fountain. I've lived in Pepperell for about 50 years now. I'm retired from the FAA as a management consultant, but my heart's always been in the garden. Since I retired, I've become active in educating myself about responsible and sustainable gardening, particularly as it concerns native plants. In the past five or six years, I've been volunteering for the New England Wildflower Society, now known as the Native Plant Trust, at Garden in the Woods in Framingham. There I've completed two certificate programs in native plant horticulture and in field botany, and I've really learned a lot about sustainability in gardening. My own home garden is a habitat garden. That's a garden that supports the local flora and the fauna without any chemicals or fertilizers and a minimum need for watering. I'm really passionate about this and I'd like to share some of what I've learned because I think it's really important for people to realize what we do in our home landscapes can really affect climate change and global warming in a significant way and that each one of us has a responsibility to think about that before we start working in our yards. The town has virtually no budget to manage the landscaping around the Peter Fitz facility right now. It's being done by a small group of volunteers with some help from the highway department. I was aware that the long garden bed near the cafeteria entrance was overgrown with weeds and highly invasive plants. As the town prepares the building for reuse in the near future, this garden bed is a real eyesore and it's in a highly visible location. So I saw this as an opportunity to step up and to volunteer to make it more attractive as well as an opportunity to share the message about the value and importance of sustainable gardening with native plants. I also feel it will help demonstrate just how beautiful the native plants are and that we don't need to sacrifice beauty in our home gardens in order to make the environment safer for everyone. I contacted this town administrator, Andrew McLean, who granted permission and I began work on clearing the weeds out later in June this, of this year. The garden bed is approximately 100 feet long and 6 feet wide. There's a center strip of crushed stone to serve as a drip edge for water runoff from the expansive roof. When the bed was created years ago, it included a modified version of a rain garden, which is becoming a popular trend for home gardeners. A rain garden is essentially a depression that incorporates gutter or roof runoff water into an attractive planting bed that works like a sponge and a natural filter cleaning the water and letting it percolate slowly into the surrounding soil. It also eliminates the need for constant watering. The middle section where the crushed rock is is essentially to capture the rain runoff coming off of the, the uh, roof edge here. So there's a lot of water that comes down here. And this is so that it's not going to back up and go into the school and leak or whatever. It can be more readily absorbed into the ground here. And this is kind of along the same thought as a rain garden, which is essentially just a depression in the ground uh, to capture the water and help it filter through the ground. It also helps to water the plants that are sitting around it. So in considering how we were going to plant this garden, I had to take into consideration the fact that we're going to have a lot of moisture here because this is a huge roof. Um, and so the plants that we've selected are suited for shade because as you can see, this is mid-afternoon right now and we're mostly in shade here. With the exception of a couple hours early in the morning, the garden sits in the shade. My goal is to replace all of the non-native plants. Uh, we've donated these to the Pepper Garden Club for their annual plant sale and to put into the gardens around town. And to instead install native plants that will attract the pollinators that are best suited for this moist shady location. There are some native ferns and a few perennials that will remain and the rest I have selected specifically as suited for this site. There are a few native plants already here. This is an uh, ostrich fern. Um, this is actually the fern that you will see in the grocery store sold as a fiddlehead when it's immature. I've also developed a design plan that considers blooms throughout the growing season and some other basic design elements. We need to think about the structure and aesthetically uh, that we're not putting anything in front of the windows, uh, maybe putting taller plants in front of the bricks, and so we also need to consider the size. We need to also look for uh, the opportunity to keep the flowers uh, in bloom throughout the season. So uh, I've divided the growing season into three parts, spring, summer, and late summer, and we've made our selections based on that 
from that information, uh, I developed a spreadsheet that also shows the color of the bloom. So essentially we've got the height, the color, where we want to put them, the taller ones basically in the back so you can see them better, and the short ones in the front that will be uh, the showcase. The plants that we're going to add will come from several different nurseries that specialize in native plants, as well as some donated from my own garden. All of the plants in this garden are native to either New England or the eastern United States down to the Appalachian region. So, why native plants? Native plants have co-evolved with insects and other animal life and specific ecosystems over millions of years. They're codependent. Some insects are specialists and they'll only lay their eggs on specific plants for their larvae to feed on when they hatch. When we take away these plants or replace them with non-native species, we affect the ability of the insects and the other animals to reproduce. When we spray chemicals on them, we kill them. The beneficial ones along with the ones that we're trying to eradicate. When we plant flowers and trees that are native to other continents, we're replacing food and habitat that is critical for some of our native fauna species. We're also adding plants to the landscapes that have no natural predators or diseases to help maintain the delicate balance needed in the natural world. Some of these plants are essentially junk food for insects and birds. Butterfly bush is a very common example that many homeowners love to include in their garden. This plant may provide some, some nectar and the insects and the birds may love them and eat them, but there's typically little nutritional value that's essential for their health. It's a Twinkie diet for them. The result is that we're losing insect and animal species and encouraging growth of invasive plant populations. So we're behind the Lawrence Library, and this is the first all-native plant garden uh, in town. It was installed three years ago. Um, a friend of mine came to me, and uh, as this trail was being built, this is the Greensbrook Trail, and it was a, a joint project by the Neshoba Conservation Trust, uh, some town employees, and the library to build a um, American Disabilities Act compliant trail. So the trail goes in a loop behind uh, through the woods here. The Boy Scouts put benches in there for folks to sit down. And we wanted to have a nice entrance at the front here. So uh, my friend asked me if I would be interested in helping her install a garden. And I said, absolutely, let's do all native plants. And um, she loved the idea. We floated it by Deb Spratt, our library director, and Ken Hartledge, the president of the Neshoba Conservation Trust. Showed them a design and what our plan was, and uh, the purchase of the plants was funded by the trust and the friends of the, the Lawrence Library. Um, so the design that we came up with here, um, again, it's, it's a basically a pretty simple design. We put some educational material here, which includes a map of the garden itself. So if you want to know what flowers are blooming at any particular time, you can look at the key and figure out we have garden primroses here in the yellow in the front. We have some downy wood mint, which is the purple right behind them. And then we have some foxglove beard tongue over here. These are all great bee flowers. So if you get your nose up close enough, uh, you'll probably see some bees in there. In the front, for a ground cover, we wanted to show a new lawn alternative that's being tried across the country, and that is native wild strawberries. Um, the strawberries are ripe right now. About a month ago, this was covered with white flowers. When we put these strawberries in here two and a half years ago, we put in 200 tiny little plants. And so I would say that they've at least quadrupled. Um, strawberries are great because you can let them go like this if you like a natural look. If you want to convert part of your lawn so that you can still mow it and people can walk on it, um, you can use strawberries for that. You can't trample on them, but uh, if it's, it's lightly used, it's fine to mow it and use it like a lawn. In the back, we have some mountain laurel, uh, some dogwood trees, some honeysuckle, and some service berry trees. And in the front, in the middle here, we have a lot of different perennials. And for the early spring, mixed in uh, below strawberry, uh, some other ground covers and little spring ephemeral flowers that will come up and uh, give you cheer in April when you think that summer or spring is never going to come. Um, so this was my first effort to try to uh, help folks realize that, that native plant gardens can look beautiful, 
they can be comfortable. This is kind of a natural look here. Um, and I was really excited about this to be a part um, of, of putting this in. Um, it makes me feel good every time I see somebody walk down that path or I see a little kid stop to pick a strawberry um, to know that maybe um, I've had some part in, in contributing to them learning more about nature or learning to love spending time in nature. Yes, I, uh, I started getting involved in uh, activities in the outdoors uh, for the town of Pepperell uh, about three and a half years ago when I joined the Neshoba Conservation Trust and uh, that group is, uh, they manage about 450 acres of conserved uh, lands in Pepperell and we have all kinds of trails and, and things like that that we uh, maintain, create, uh, so we're we're always busy with uh, some kind of a project. At the Lawrence Library, uh, we built a, a handicapped accessible trail uh, in the rear of the library. And uh, it's, it's the only library in the state that ha has a handicapped accessible uh, trail uh, attached to it. And uh, it was uh, totally uh, donated materials and labor. It didn't, probably would have been a $20,000 project, uh, but we were lucky enough to get uh, all the materials and the labor uh, and the equipment uh, donated. And uh, probably took us three or four months to, uh, to complete it. And it came out great. And a lot of, a lot of people use it. So we, we worked on that one all last summer and uh, completed it go back down there every now and then for a little bit of maintenance. And, uh, and then uh, over on uh, Park Street, we, we have a, uh, a conservation land called uh, Seminator Woods. And it's about a 40 acre parcel. And uh, we took two acres of that and dedicated it to a, a pollinator meadow. So my, my interest in the, uh, the pollinator meadow uh, activities got me interested enough so that I wanted to uh, build my own at home. And uh, Deb was kind enough to, uh, to uh, help, help design it uh, and uh, give me some, uh, some very valuable advice as to how to plant, what shape to make it, you know, what, what, what to do. And uh, so I, I planted that in mid-May, and uh, and now uh, challenged with uh, pulling crabgrass, <laughs> which is uh, I wish wildflowers grew as well as crabgrass did. <laughs> but so it, it, yeah, we we do a lot of a lot of projects for the town. Uh, this is another offshoot of one of those. Uh, it's a neat little project and I'm glad to help. So now that I've retired and I have a lot of time on my hands, I think it's time to give back to the town. I've lived here for 40 years and uh, time to give back a little. So if you are interested in learning more about native plant gardening, I can recommend two books, both of which are available at the Lawrence Library. The first one is Bringing Nature Home. It's written by Douglas Tallamy. Um, this is the, the book that really started getting people thinking very hard about what it is, uh, what type of impact uh, our gardening has on the insect life because he was an entomologist, or he is an entomologist. He speaks all over the country now. The second book, recently published, is called Garden Revolution, along the same lines. This is written by Larry Weiner and Thomas Christopher, both very well-known names in the horticultural field. So this is about landscaping and how it ties into uh, changes in the environment and how we can be better stewards of the land.